Hi there. Hi, sorry for the delay there. I forgot we have to uh, allow everybody in the room now. <laughs> right. So, Hello. Anyway, we're all in. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. <laughs> I think they're on mute. Yeah, I think it defaults to everyone being on mute as they enter. Yeah, yep. Oh, there's more people in the waiting room. Hold on. Here we go. Melanie, a few of us are coming from the previous session, so they're on their way. Okay. Thanks for the heads up. Hello, everyone. So sorry for the delay. Um, we just had a, a few few technical glitches, but we're we'll wait a second for some of the rest of the folks to um, to log in. But um, as a reminder, my name is Kimberly Veglianti, and I am uh, the Education Partnership Manager at the Greater Phoenix Chamber Foundation. So let me see if Doris, who is our lead for our perform for um, today, is on. And I see Doris, you are on. Yes, I'm on. Sorry, there were some issues with getting on, so I am here. No worries. Our apologies. That could have been on our end as well. Um, so for today, I just want to quickly introduce our, you know, presenters. And Doris, do you have everyone with you today that you'll need? Yep, we're right here. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, everyone, we have the University of Phoenix on today, and they are going to be talking to you all from an employer perspective on what skills, what credentials, what the workforce looks like, um, you know, for your students, and then different types of opportunities even that you can gain working in the university setting. So you might think this might be an educational one. It's more of the workforce side of a university. So it's a really cool and unique perspective. So I'd like to introduce Doris um, Savron. She um, will be leading the session today. And Doris, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself and then I will hand the presentation over to you. Feel free to share your screen and I will be here for anything you might need. Sure, thank you. So I am Doris Avron. I am the Vice Provost at the University of Phoenix. I've actually just celebrated my 19th year at the university last week. Um, and my responsibility overall is with um, what our program strategy is. So what credentials do we offer at the degree level, certificate level, non-degree level, um, and then also the faculty that teach in our programs. And I brought a couple of deans with me. Um, we have Dr. Mark Johansson, who oversees our healthcare programs, non-nursing. Um, we have Dr. Eve Crave, who um, she actually has come from a multiple sets of areas in our um, university. She went from healthcare to our doctorate to now the innovation dean for all of the um, supporting all the colleges. And then we have Dr. Chris Neider, who is our um, Dean overseeing our social and behavioral sciences programs. And then we have um, Brianna Houlihan, who oversees our general studies. Um, so a lot of the gen ed courses and a couple of degree um, courses in environmental science and English. So, so for this session, um, I wanted to highlight really the drivers around what is happening with trends and how that's leading um, to both the needs for very specific soft skills as well as, well as technical skills. In the last session, and I think we'll have time, so I'll try to creep in some of the last session content too. We had talked about credentialing and what trends we're seeing on the credentialing side, as well as how do you get into a career path in, edu in higher ed that doesn't necessarily um, mean a faculty or on the academic side, because there are a ton of jobs on the non-academic side as well. Um, so I think we'll have time for both, but I'll start with, I'm going to share a PowerPoint. I'll start with some high level stuff and then we'll leave plenty of time for Q&A because I know that that's where a lot of the people are anxious to get in the discussion and learn from and um, see how they can apply that. So I'm going to share my first deck. So give me a minute while we work through, oh, I need to host. So it doesn't let me share Kimberly because I don't have the co-host ability. Melanie, could you please give um, Doris some the co-hosting ability? I know we have Melanie on the call who is... Yeah, I'm working on it right now. Okay. Thank you. Awesome, awesome. Just give Why this. won't it let me do that? Hold on. 
If not, I can send it if that's easier. If somebody can. Yeah, I also have yours and I could share it. So let me okay. pull it up and then if, if worse comes to worse. Yeah, for some reason, I'm, I apologize. It's not giving me the option here. No worries. Let me just pull it up because I do have it saved. Technology sometimes is so awesome. And then in moments. <laughs> mm -hmm. Let me just sign into my my drive so I could pull it up and then okay. and actually you sent it this morning, Doris. So let me. Yes. Yeah. Fine. Yeah, the technical and soft skills one is the one I'll go over first. Perfect. And I'm pulling that right now for you. Okay. And I can start while we're waiting for it. So Kim, can you pull that up? I'm gonna I'm pulling it up off my email now and then I will share my screen. So but you have the option to share your screen? I sh yes, I do actually. So share. Okay. So we'll yeah, for some reason I cannot. Oh, no. I'm sorry. Adjust no. the screen sharing. For some um, reason. I apologize. I do not. It says host disabled participant screen. Yeah. So all right. Let me see. I Let apologize to everybody. I don't know why this is. So I can start, and then we could always, if we figure it out, can Melanie? We can have. Or maybe Kimberly, you can email it to Melanie because she has the host. Yeah, because I could share it that way. But in the meantime, while you guys are sending it, I can go ahead and start so that we could take advantage of our time together. Um, so um, the biggest. So I want to talk about the drivers and what's happening in um, you know the industries, the different industries, and nationally that is really driving some change in how we have to think about preparing people. Um, so the biggest driver, which probably is no surprise to anyone on this call, because you're feeling it in your own lives, is really the systems and smart machines. So the technology has advanced, and the way it is advanced is it can take on um, more roles that normally or traditionally have been done by humans at some levels, at basic levels, but it can't still do some of the things that we do best as humans, and that's connecting the dots and um, pulling the story together. So then it allows us to really focus on what we do best in supplementing what the machines could do for us. Um, so there's a lot of this um, uh, almost collaboration between tech and human that is changing really what how we're going to have to work and I'll talk about that in, uh, in a minute. The other piece which probably especially now you guys are feeling it too is this whole slew of data intensity information's coming at us from all areas of our life um, on our phones, on our computers, on our TVs, um, in conversations, in emails. Um, we're just inundated with information. I think I saw a stat that we'll see more information in one year than people have seen for decades. Um, and the ability to really sift through what is accurate, important <laughs> um, to make decisions is a skill that is starting to formulate um, is just because you just because you see something doesn't mean it's truth. And so how do you um, work through that to really make good decisions. Um, the third piece is around new media and technology and really more that uh, technology that's around how we communicate. Um, so social media is a big part here. Facebook's Instagram's um, Microsoft Teams, uh, Zoom, which is what we're on now. I mean, we've all become intimately familiar with Zoom and Teams in the last few months, especially if you haven't been exposed to it before. But um, along with that also comes this whole, well, what are the um, what are the impacts to what we say and do and our personal brand and our identity as a result of all of that being out there forever? Snapchat's out there. Like there are different technologies that keep creeping up that are um, created to initially communicate, engage, and connect people, but that all leads a foot, leaves a put, footprint. And so how does that really play into how, what we need to be aware of and how we teach people to use that in a way that is helpful and not destructive or damaging to a career? Um, and then just new orgs, as a result of those three things, you also see organizations just changing how they're designed. You've got, you know, organizations that are 100% virtual and who's leading and how decisions are made are being pushed down to lower levels of the organization. Um, you've got organizational structures that have part intern, like part structure, part um, partnerships with other vendors or other organizations to be able to um, create synergy to, there we are. Um, to deliver, um, you know, better solutions 
uh, more quickly. So you see a lot of this collaboration among um, and between, I'm on slide one, uh, the next slide, if you wanna flip to that one. Uh, oh, wrong deck, actually. This was from the last, the last session. I'll get to that one later. The one we need is the technical sales. I'll keep going. Um, so um, just expanding the boundaries of how we work together, how we learn, how who creates what part of the value chain um, is becoming a bigger, bigger deal to the point where sometimes you can't, if you create a seamless experience, you can't tell where one organization stops and the other um, you know, the other begins in the seamless transaction to deliver a product or service. So that's changing how we work as well. And then the one piece that it will be a driver, we just don't, thank you. We just don't know how it'll play out yet. It's just still too early to tell us just this impact of COVID and what it's not only what it's going to do to the economy, but it is changing how we work in multiple industries. Telehealth is becoming really huge. Um, I mean, Arizona led the way for this already, but it's becoming even a bigger deal in how you actually leverage technology to deliver care where it doesn't always require an in-person office visit. Um, so um, that's a trend we're seeing. This whole virtual collaboration and how we use technology to be productive and set boundaries because we're seeing a lot of wins on leveraging technology to stay engaged and um, really do um, work, but it's also bleeding into boundaries of home and how do you manage all of that and what skill does it take to do that. So that's a lot of what we're seeing that's driving ultimately this change of what roles are available, but then also what are the skills that are needed to be successful in this new changing environment. And it'll continue to change. So um, how do we then pay attention and continue to adapt as those changes happen? So if you want to go to the next slide. And uh, the result of those changes actually um, is driving this need for very particular um, what we call soft skills area. Um, and it doesn't matter what report you look at, but the la over the course of the last few years, these are always the ones that make the top 10 list consistently. There's others that kind of come in and out as well, um, but these are pretty consistently the last few years end up on the top 10 list. So sense making, so this is around, I mean, it's about critical thinking. So how do you think through what you're presented with and making decisions? But then it's also taking some of what you see for data and information and being able to tell the story of how those all those connected pieces work. Um, so being able to Think about what you're seeing and then what's the application of what you're seeing to get to a place where you potentially need to make a decision or inform people on how we need to change as a result of that. Also in interwoven in there, and I'll have some of the deans talk about this and what they're seeing in their own industry areas, is this um, piece about empathy. This is really growing quite a bit in healthcare. Like how does that contribute to the care you deliver, how you treat people, how people experience the organization, but it's becoming huge also even in education. Like how do we, pathetic fact, you knowing that people are dealing with a lot of other um, responsibilities and it's no longer where the degree is only and the only commit somebody is making because their students are not traditional students anymore. They're working, they have families, and even traditional universities are starting to see a change in their demographic mix that is really requiring some of this um, to change. And then obviously employers have dealt with this forever. Um, social intelligence, this is really around how you work and communicate with people, how to assess the emotion in the room and or on the virtual environment in order to be building strong relationships and really get the best out of people. So really being able to read your um, the context of the situation, being able to read people in that situation, and then being able to adapt and flex so that you can build trust in relationships because people have to work closely together. There are no longer jobs where it's just you. You're usually connected to somebody else that has to help you get your work done because they have a piece of the puzzle. Cultural competency, you've seen quite a bit around this, um, around especially allyship and anti-racism more recently, but it's just how do you do that in an environment where you are more diverse, but your systems and structures and things that were built decades and decades ago didn't consider that component. So how do you build 
competency in this area so that people can start to recognize where things need to be broken down and rethought. Um, and then how do you really see the value in those differences and really make that work in how you uh, develop talent, how you use talent, how you actually put people together to create creative solutions and innovations because those different perspectives do matter. Data continues to show when you have a more diverse organization, you have better outcomes, financial outcomes, uh, longevity outcomes for an organization, um, engagement and satisfaction of employees within the organization. All the data consistently tells us that um, that, that is actually building, building uh, more success within an organization for the people in it, as well as the organization itself. Digital literacy is a big one. Um, and this is not just about, can I use Word? Excel, PowerPoint, email, it is how do I actually leverage all the technology that's out there to effectively communicate, solve problems, engage people if I'm a people leader or engage teams if I'm on a team. And then the other piece that's newer to this is really your footprint and your identity and kind of who you are in that um, because it does matter. You know, I share this example with my niece all the time who's in college. I'm like, you better be careful what you put out there because employers do see it. Like you don't think they do, but I gave examples where I was getting ready to make decisions about who to bring in for interviews. And I did quick scans of social media and two people didn't make the cut as a result of what we were seeing on their social media accounts that made it their values on that. Those accounts did not match the values of the organization. And so people do and more frequently are looking at that because it does. We've seen recently um, students lose scholarships to their colleges because of stuff they posted on um, social media. Um, so there are people paying attention and it is creating a footprint and it's building a brand overall, whether you intend it to or not. Um, and then internally, it's building a brand too. So everything you do and how you communicate leveraging that technology is building a brand for you internally as well as a um, for your career path. And then virtual collaboration. I think this one's an obvious one to all of us. How do you actually work more effectively and influence decisions when you're not in the same room with people? You're having to learn how to leverage technology to read facial expressions. Um, be engaging and communicating, knowing that people probably have 20 distractions sitting right next to them and their desk and the computer, whether it's kids, whether it's laundry that's being waiting to be transferred, whether it's, you know, uh, things happening outside in the neighborhood noise wise, like there are a lot of distractions. Um, and then innovation continues to be one of those. How do we uh, leverage all of these tools and resources to get more creative of the solutions that we offer? So, and then I put quite a few of uh, the sources that consistently speak to some of these in their reporting. Um, and I shared with the other um, group that Lumina.org actually has a lot of this as well. So if you want research, they, they come out with pretty regular research on what's happening trending wise. And they'll probably be the first ones that will come out if they haven't just come out with COVID related impacts as well. Okay, next slide. And then these are some of the, so those are the soft skills that apply across industries. It doesn't matter whether you're going into business management, into IT, into nursing, into other, uh, you know, the specific career tracks. Those are soft skills that are pretty relevant across because we use a tool called MC that really looks at job openings that are out there by job title, like uh, SIPSOC codes, which really aligns very similar jobs. And we look at what are the most in-demand skills that are listed, both soft and hard. And then we map those in our programs to make sure we're addressing those regardless of what program somebody's in to make sure that we're getting the top skills mentioned. And so they validate both the um, soft skills we just talked about, but they also are validating job openings around these tech skills as well. So blockchain, if you're not familiar, it's a way that information is transferred in a secure way to do work. Um, it started out in one particular industry, but it now is becoming more and more popular. We're actually starting to see this make its way into education as well, because you're transferring data on students' records across institutions to make sure you're transferring credits, you're looking at their financial records. So it's becoming pretty, um, it's being looked at more widely across organizations for ways to chop up information to transfer and then pull the story together. Cloud computing, we're going from like hard server rooms to storing things on cloud networking. So the skills on how to do that versus, you know, watching a hard drive or computer in a, an enclosed room 
um, you're now having to learn how does it work in a virtual environment to store secure information, uh, which normally machines did for you before. Um, artificial intelligence is another one. Um, we're actually starting to see this pick up in education, higher ed as well. So how do you leverage it for different um, components? Um, you see this in a lot in also simulation labs where there's a blend of some of this happening where somebody can get practice in a lab before they go out and practice on a human. Um, and so that's picking up scientific commuting, STEM, anything related to STEM, stats, math, um, all because of data and how data is being pulled and then being able to uh, teed up in a way that people can digest. So there's a lot around that. UX design, this usually lives in your marketing world, but is very closely aligned to IT tech because it's all about designing the user experience. So for us, it's designing the user experience for somebody that might be coming to us just to make a decision about a degree. It's designing the user experience within the classroom and how they actually experience content in the classroom. It's designing the user experience and how we deliver services to them on their electronic campus page versus walking into a physical campus space. Um, this is actually, uh, it's one of the probably fastest, highest growing areas in marketing, and, but it requires a tech scope. So digital um, marketing and things around social media and blending all of that is also another big space in marketing that's growing exponentially. Cybersecurity, no surprise here. We see this a challenge, um, in every industry, but we've seen a super um, intense focus on it in healthcare because more and more technology is being leveraged in healthcare with medical records, imaging, and the story of putting the patient records together in treatment protocols. So there's more and more um, hypersensitivity to how those machines deliver care, but then how you also tell the story of the patient um, in the system. And so there's a lot there. Retail, we've already seen cybersecurity and retail. We've seen a lot of the, this is probably one space where the U.S., when you stack rank skill capabilities, this is one space that U.S. comes in lowest ranked among most countries. I mean, Europe beats us on this. Russia beats us on this. Um, Global Skills Index talks, you can go get that report and I can send it out too so they can deliver. Um, email it out to everyone. It stack ranks all the different countries on these three dimensions between business, IT, um, um, and, um, and cyber, some of those components of the tech skills. Um, programming, no surprise, new languages come out on programming all the time. SQL, Python are very common now for programming data and really making that usable. Um, for decisions. Web development is still there. A lot of work is done on web spaces to be able to share information with a student, to influence them to take an action, to deliver service. Um, so every organization has that footprint at this point. And then on the business, more of the non-technical um, side, you have these hard skills around just data analysis, like how, what do you do with the data? Um, analytical reasoning, like how do you make decisions with being inundated like we had talked about with all those particular pieces of information coming at you. Um, programming, um, stat side, accounting finance. Finance actually we're starting to see a lot even at the entry level where you might not need a degree but you need some sort of badging or credential um, to get your foot in the door at the beginning levels of finance and so there's probably opportunity there for a career path. Um, I know the Chamber's doing some creative thing with some financial institutions to drive um, people to that career path as well. And then project management, both on the business side, but we've also seen this um, growing from a technical side as, as in safe, agile, scrum area. So how do you effectively manage, um, manage IT projects that design quickly for a user experience that is quality, in a way that continues to adapt to the new technology. So, uh, so safe agile is probably one of the most common um, skills we see where as soon as somebody puts that badge on their profile, LinkedIn or other places, they get contact after contact of uh, potential job opportunities. Um, so those are the hard, um, the hard skills that are tied to some of those in demand um, changes. So what I can do is, I could give you a high level of the other slide or we can jump into QA and then jump over to the other slide because there'll probably be questions that tie to that slide. So 
Kim or Melanie, do you guys have a preference? I could do either or. Maybe we could do some QA now and then jump into the other one. Sounds good. So questions from the group? Hi, my name is Jane Hall. I have a question. Um, I teach at Pima Community College down here in Tucson, Arizona. And just some of the things that you were talking about, the soft skills and the more technical skills, what, just reaching out to the entire group, how we're looking at how do we incorporate this as part of our curriculum, you know, down to the classroom level, you know, um, you know, obviously you teach your subject matter, but also how can we bring in soft skills or, you know, some of the, you know, cultural competency, that, that type of thing into the actual classroom, classroom experience, if you could speak to that. Yeah, so, so I'll talk about how we map it to make sure it shows up in our classroom experience, but it's applicable regardless of where you do it. So when we map a program or a credential, so even at a certificate level, we look at if somebody were to come out at the back end of this, what's, what should they be able to do, right? So what are all the things they should be able to do? And it's not just the technical skills for like medical records, but what do the job openings say on the soft skills that need to be mapped as well? And then we create that map to show Here's the professional drivers, which a lot of times are soft skills. Here are the technical aspects of the skills, which are tied to that career path they've chosen, whether it's IT, healthcare, um, education. And then here are the overall university learning goals we think is important for everybody to come out of. And then we look at, okay, if that's what they need to learn, what kinds of courses do they need to have? And then which one of those courses is going to introduce the concepts? is going to reinforce or we're going to assess for mastery. And so that's how we map our programs. So you could have a, a management class that actually is going to map communication skills, presentation skills, um, how to do a SWOT analysis for the be able to take data and then make a decision out of it based on what the data is telling you about your organization, because it makes sense to do it that way. But then we'll map it that way. So in a high school, junior high level, you can look at the way assignments are constructed. And I'll let the other dean speak to this too, because they'll have some good insights. But let's just say that you really want them to learn collaboration um, skills. You could, the way you design assignment could be instead of individual work, you build it in a way they have to collaborate and they have to use technology to do it. So then you're building multiple ways to get them exposed to the digital components of what they need to learn using Zoom or other technology that's approved by the school. I think Google um, Hangouts is a, a big area now. Um, and then you have them have to use that to learn that while they actually do the assignment that teaches them the actual hard skill you're trying to teach them in a way where they're also having to do it in a diverse group of people. So they're learning those particular components. So you can layer it in. Now you might have to expose them to some things before you do that project around how do you work well together? What are the rules of building effective teams? How do you build a charter? And so those are things you would have to do as part of your instruction before you put them into that group setting. Or you can tell them to look for those things and then make that part of their learning as they do their like journal entries or things that they could share out as learning components. But that's how we layer ours in because they're soft skills we build into our programs. It's not just technical skills. And so we do it through a map first. We start with the end in mind and then we look, look to, okay, if that's the end, how are we going to assess what they're able to do? And then where are we putting that content? Now let's build the assessment in that class. And then deans, I don't know if you guys have anything else you want to share related to that. I can share a little bit, Doris. Can you hear me? You guys hear me? Yep. Okay. <laughs> so um, I would offer what we ended up doing in our in our masters is building empathy in. So this is this is around empathy, but it's a pretty traditional soft skill. And what we did and what I would encourage you not to be afraid of is using humanities content. So um, we use narrative nonfiction, but you can use poetry, art, students can go on a, a virtual museum tour, but the literature is showing that there's a connection between engaging in what we would consider to be the traditional liberal arts or humanities content and building skills around appreciating ambiguity, being okay with diversity, that kind of stuff. And it's nice because um, the literature shows a clear connection and students we found our, our master's students really enjoyed reading believe it or not and started book clubs of their own at their organizations because many of them are working but for students at the community college i would imagine the, the drive would be the same 
because you know there's it's fun to kind of read a story versus reading a textbook and so i would say um, the humanities content did we did well using that and i would encourage um, you to take a look at that too there's best practice out there around it um I, this is brianna hi everybody can you hear me I would also offer that, in, like in particular, and uh, for example, we have two programs within the College of General Studies and they're very different content. So we have an English program that we offer and we have an environmental science program. But even with, um, you know, the deans have a lot of intersection when they're putting their curriculum together because we need environmental scientists to be able to communicate to people who aren't within environmental science if we want to get folks to care about what's going on in their world and really understand what's going on in their world and get excited about this, this um, area of study, then we have to be able to story tell. So it's a really good point that Eve brings up. We have to be able to story tell, tell and we have to help our students and graduates be able to um, you know, take some of these maybe more complex topics and really break them down into a communication that folks will understand and folks from diverse different backgrounds. So, um, what does it, you know, what do environmental studies mean to someone from an urban environment versus a rural environment? So really taking into consideration, um, you know, the different folks that you're interacting with and, and how you're going to be able to tell those different stories. So that's something that we strive to do in our programs a lot, too. I think, Chris, were you going to say something? Yeah, I, I was also going to add, um, I just, I think it's important, too, that students have the opportunity to practice as much as they can for those real world experiences that they can bring into, um, if you can bring them into the curriculum and they can apply them, that just gives them that additional opportunity to practice those technology skills or how do you weave in, you know, the empathy. Um, for example, we have a counseling program and so now we're introducing telehealth. So how do you become a counselor while using the technology component and still show the empathy and all the counselor dispositions that go with that. So allowing students to be able to practice those skills in the program is really beneficial too, because then that's also preparing them, you know, for those industry um, skills that they'll be expected to have once they leave the program. Great, thank you. Other questions? I have a question. Um, it's a little, off topic, but I just, I cannot not ask this because it's just burning in my head, Doris. Um, I actually uh, got my um, educational counseling degree from the University of Phoenix, and I always admired your curriculum. Um, I'm wondering, are you coming up with something to help us who might want to connect different, you know, because I want to know how to connect with students, and I'm always trying to explore ways to do it with technology, but it's, you know, with all the things that are happening, things are changing too quickly. Yeah. So we yeah. need help. Yeah. You know, and I keep telling the school districts, the teachers can't just shift to online curriculum yeah. from, you know, cause it's a different model. Yeah. Uh, and I know what it feels like, but I have yeah. a hard time showing them. Yeah, so what I can do is um, I can share some of the things we've done quickly as a result of COVID and then more longer term strategy. So we took all our non degree single course um, content that we had for teachers with technology that were had a technology focus. So how to use Google Hangouts, how to use some of this other content to build engaging curriculum. And we made the we offered those all for free from April to June so that teachers could quickly get some content that would get them exposed to it. We also stood up a virtual teaching academy and I believe those recordings are available. I can send that link um, to the group and you can send it out to everyone where there was different breakout sessions that covered what you need to prepare for and how do you do this now in the um, virtual environment going forward because the likelihood is we're going to have to do this for a little bit while longer and then it probably applies even when you have natural disasters in different places and you can't go to a physical building, you might have to do virtual in those cases. Um, so what we're talking about though longer term um, is taking and so badging is a really popular component now because you've got people that are already in a career field but need to keep up with the changing time. So how can you create credentials that don't require everybody to go back to get a degree or a certificate that's shorter form, self-paced, but they still learn the relevant information. So the two spaces we're actually looking at right now, which is 
in just talks right now, but we'll deliver quickly once we make a decision because that's what we're known for, is virtual teaching specialist credential. So how do you become a virtual teacher that you know not only builds curriculum that's effective, but how do you be engaging with technology? And then how do you assess learning in a way that's appropriate too, that really you're validating how that, um, how that is coming across in a virtual environment. And then also looking at, it's gonna be different for different age groups, right? You can't do the same thing for high school that you would do for um, middle school. And then the other one is we're really looking at a cultural competence badge because no matter what industry you work in, we all gotta learn how to work better together. And we need to know what to look for when we know that there's systematic um, issues with how people make their way through an organization. So if you could teach people about that, then people can speak up when they see it, because you can't always see it at a leadership level. You can you can have everybody in an organization really be thinking about what a healthy org structure looks like and values people and gives people equal opportunity to grow so that you're leveraging talent from all groups. So that's another one we're looking at. And then telemedicine is one that we've said, you know, there's probably some things here that we could do for nurses, for health, uh, counselors, for other healthcare groups that are really leveraging tele telehealth now. And, you know, Arizona led the way in this. Like they've made regulations that allow this to happen because they do recognize there's some things you should be able to do over the phone and not make somebody drive in, especially for rural areas where there is a long um, commute to get to a medical um, uh, practitioner. Um, so we are looking at some of those and we're continuing to pay attention. We do know on the financial side, entry level, there's probably an opportunity um, to build up some of that, but um, we're also looking at how do you leverage Teams, Zoom, all of that for effective meeting structure. So that might be a single course that somebody could take on their own. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity there. So we're looking at data to just say, how do we continue to do some of this non-degree um, components that quickly get somebody a skill that doesn't shouldn't require a college degree because they are either already have one or it's knowledge that doesn't need to be learned through a degree program. Yeah. Other questions? I will add one more thing to that. We all look, when we design things like that, we also look at how we can articulate that into credit if somebody should ever wanna come back later. So that's one of the things too that's super important. And we're seeing this from research from just all the work that we're doing to understand student decision-making behavior and what are they looking for? What are the search terms? What are the, what's important to them when they're making a decision? And everyone's saying, if I'm gonna spend this kind of time and money, I gotta be able to do it effectively um, with living my life because people have kids, they have jobs. Um, it's got to be relevant. So it's got to tie to something that's going to give me a better job or make me more effective in my current job. And that I don't, I'm not being asked to take courses that just don't matter to just create busy work. So there's, and there's kind of, like we said, there's very important things in soft skills that happen through general education and other courses. So you don't want to lose that, but how do you make sure you're not also making people go through six classes to get a certain credential that really only probably only requires two because they already have skills from being on the job before. And so, so we're getting that colleges, universities are going to have a lot of pressure to really respond in that way and really being focused on the skills and what people should be able to do, and then be able to articulate that along the way, not just waiting for a four-year degree, but along the way, what skills are you learning, and making that displayable to students as they're making their way through, because along the way, they should be able to get different levels of jobs, and not just wait until the end of the four years. And in some cases, especially in IT, you may not even need an associate's. You could do a badge, a boot camp, or something that gets you the skills much faster. And so really being um, aware of those and being able to tell, tell those stories to students is important, especially now. Students are gonna get nine, 10 different jobs in their lifetime. No longer is a career path look like this, it's a squiggle. Like it's all around movement up and down across. And so you gotta be open to the learning and taking advantage of opportunities in different spaces um, because that eventually will lead to a career trajectory. I, this was not my long-term plan to land where I did. It happened through various shifts and changes in my career path that had nothing to do with my bachelor's degree. Other questions? So Doris, just to say, and Jen, I'm glad you asked that question. She's in our in my cohort. So 
um, will you be posting that um, link with the virtual class instruction? Because that was really going to be my question. I mean, we were yeah. kind of all thrown into this, right? And using all of yeah. these different technologies and we're going into the fall where we know we're going to be virtual. Yeah. And I definitely am interested in, in developing skills as a virtual instructor. And that's yeah. different than just being an online instructor. Yeah. And so we I really appreciate any it Melanie or Kimberly and they can figure out the best way to get it to everyone. So they okay. can get to the DL list. Because there are probably other people in other cohorts that will want that information too. And it's open to everyone. So great. Thank you. Yep. I was going to say, um, Cindy will be sharing out links to all the Zoom recordings from the sessions right. this week, as well as resources. So we'll make sure and get those um, gathered together. <laughs> Doris, one thing um, I I used to I used to be a teacher for about five or six years, and when I kind of transferred over into the more the business side of things. One thing I didn't know when I was a teacher is all of this workforce data that goes into creating these essentially pipelines of talent from when you're in high, when you're a student in middle or high school, and then what employers are looking for. I didn't know all of this data existed. I didn't know what MZ was. I didn't know what burning glass data was. Um, can you kind of dive a little bit deeper into that for teachers, what it is, um, and then where they could maybe find this information? Yeah. Um, so they can incorporate, they're almost like standards and teachers are so used to standards, so. Yeah, and so it is a little, I mean, so there are multiple places right now. It's not, because there's such shifts happening, there's not one place to find everything, but there are some core places where you're going to get the bulk of what you need to learn. So Lumina.org has a ton of information on trends, career paths, education, what skills are required. They do an, an incredible job partnering with a number of different organizations and really keeping up with the times to really frame. So we pay attention to a lot of what comes out of Lumina.org. MC is um, an organization. If you go to MC, I think it's .org or .com, one of those. We can get that also to everybody. I think I have it on the slide. Um, it is an organization that specifically captures all job opening data and is able to give it to you by job titles, by industry layers, um, and then you can look at patterns of what's showing up for skills and experience. And so that data, lots of, well, I don't know if lots, but the universities we're paying attention to and what we're doing use that information because it's almost real time to really continue to make sure that we're aligning our curriculum to the things that are in high demand so that if somebody hires a ma management grad and they are expecting them to have these five skills, it's built in our program. So then they're getting that out of our program. We're also taking a look at that data to actually track what isn't requiring a degree, but is requiring really specific skill sets to create paths of just credentialing that is not a degree or certificate that could be done faster, could be done on somebody's own, and then has the right level of assessments to be able to upskill people. Because the upskilling is probably just as high of a demand now as getting people into the college degree pipelines. So we're seeing both of that, the pressure from both of that. Um, there's Educause does a lot, um, has a lot. Um, I think Kale, Eve, you mentioned Kale was another one around soft and hard skills and career paths. A, a lot of the now, especially in Arizona, you're seeing that college sites are doing some of this as a service ad. So I know ASU has stuff on there. We have stuff on our sites. Um, but I would say Lumina is a great place to start. Kale is another place. Um, and then we'll send you a couple of reports too that we use and that organization information is on there as well. And you could just look for updates in that organization. But there's probably four different places we look at most of the time for data, MZ, Lumina, um, Educause is a big one for us as well because they do a lot of research and they're tied to employer partnerships. Um, and then we survey employers as well. So we do that as part of our own internal work to really understand what career paths are happening. And then we have actually advisory councils for each of our college content areas that are made up of business leaders in that space. So like nursing has nurse leaders and other healthcare providers in that advisory council. Um, uh, education has superintendents, teachers, and other experts in ed space. Um, you know, so we have experts that are telling us, what are you seeing? What are the gaps? And um, that helps us really 
inform programs as well. So you could actually build your own little advisory council to help you kind of put some of that together too. A lot of people will do that um, at no cost because they just want to contribute and they have a lot to contribute. So um, we've done that. And then we do have an employer partnership group internally in-house that actually will do a lot of the employer um, relationship building to just determine what are the highest needs from employers. And then we try to build some things, repurpose some of our content to build for specific employer groups as well. We've done quite a bit with manpower and helping them get, especially now during COVID, uh, what are some basic skills that people need to get to be able to fill the jobs that are open, which are more entry level right now from a hiring standpoint. And so they take courses through us and then that validates that they got that skill, then manpower then gives them some of the potential for the job openings. Hopefully that helps answer that question. Yeah. Other? Other question? Do the deans wanna add anything else they missed that you're just dying to say? Oh, it looks like Mark. Other than it's there. absolutely an exciting place to be and in delivery of education, period. I think there's enormous challenges, but there are enormous opportunities and industries are growing in healthcare alone, um, looking at the integration of, uh, you know, the five components of emotional intelligence, empathy being one of the primary ones. Um, we're seeing, you know, the demand in, in the uh, actual business sector of people wanting students or wanting new hires to come in with that ability. And they're directly asking for it now. And so it's, it's really fun, but you're right, coming up with ways to integrate that because you need to engage the student in a way that is current and relevant. And so we work very hard in with our industry advisory panel, looking at creating scenarios that actually make them more ready for the actual thing when they get there and being able to identify it when they see it. That's it, I just had to talk. <laughs> Thank you, Doris. Yeah, and I will say that there's growth spaces across industry too. So one that we've seen significantly is teachers going into ed tech roles because they need the teaching experience to build up curriculum in technology, but they need that voice. We've seen nurses go into analytics, data, tech space to help formulate what does this data have to do in order for me to be able to deliver better care. We've seen technology experts. I mean, we can't keep up with the tech needs we need in our own institution. And there are shortages of specific like programming languages and really understanding Tableau and Python and some of those components. Everybody's fighting for that, but we especially need that in our space because we're looking at data to really better inform us along the way. How do we continue to enhance learning outcomes? So telling that story through data of how students are doing it every part of their life cycle feeds us information that we can tweak along the way before they get to the end of their degree and really help them get the right services and support if necessary based on what we're seeing in learning outcomes. So you see a lot of, and that's why I put um, a comment in the Zoom chat, there's a lot of cross college collaboration in being able to share content across our curriculum. We're actually designing bachelor's programs in a way that leaves a lot of space open through the electives buckets to take credentialing from other um, college spaces. So like if you're in healthcare management, you have enough credits in your elective bucket that you could go get a cybersecurity credential in the healthcare space so then it puts you that much further ahead to go into technology and healthcare. So we're creating, the, the, the way we've re-architected our design of our bachelors allows for that collaboration so that you're coming out with two or three badges on top of your technical career path knowledge that you need, the professional skills you need to be in that space. Um, so that's, that's been a big deal too, because there's a lot of sharing across, and that's why we have Eve also focused on innovation, because you could be collaborating across those college um, structures to be able to really deliver better experiences and learning opportunities for our students. And if I could just ask another question, in, in terms of trends, are you still seeing any room for particularly students being able to learn on the job, like an internship, 
or employers? Is the trend out there that they expect students to show up once they're hired and be ready to go? Can you talk yeah. a little bit about that? Yeah, so take COVID out of it because that's kind of messing with a lot of trends that we're seeing right now. But micro internships is a pretty hot um, thing we're looking at because you don't need to do full six month internships, but how do you do micro projects? Um, and internships within the curriculum so that they could part, make that part of their portfolio to be able to show an employer, hey, I've not only learned the theory around this, but look at what I've been able to design as a result of this or apply as a result of this. Um, I will tell you, it is such, uh, employers, if you look at all the research that's out there, what confidence level they have in people being prepared coming out of degree programs, it's not high. Like they think the institutions are not responding fast enough. Their information is dated. They don't, they're not paying attention to up and coming trends. And so there's a lot of pressure in being able to prove it. And that's where credentialing is coming in. How do you badge what they've learned? Well, in order to badge and assess what they're learning, you have to give them assignments or activities that can demonstrate that they've learned and not just write a paper. So how do you do some of that as a design of curriculum? So yeah, um, micro internships is a big one that we're looking, how do we scale that for us, for our online students? Um, how do you partner with some, some of our employers are willing to partner at capstone classes to say, give them this project in marketing and let them apply what they learned in their program related to marketing, but bringing in all those other elements that a business degree should actually enable them to make a better decision. Um, we're looking at creative, embedded creative content that's already out there, so we don't have to design it. So um, Pluralsight, Udacity, some other industry Coursera, our industry um, organizations that are doing learning, but they're not institutional, but that learning can apply. So instead of repurposing, instead of rebuilding on our own and trying to design something that is as good as what's already out there, how do you just build synergies and leverage that and make that part of a curriculum experience? Or tell them to go do that first, come back, apply it to your elective buckets, come get your degree, but in the meantime, you can get a job as soon as you get that credential. Google was an example that just recently said, um, we're no longer gonna require a bachelor's degree. If you take this set of courses in this area through Coursera, we're gonna count, because they're confident that they've assessed what they needed to assess, they've learned what they needed to learn, that's good enough for us, come get a job with us. Uh, uh, Amazon is doing that with a lot of their um, content. They're actually building internal on their own because they can't, get people fast enough. And so a lot of the pressure on institutions is gonna come from employers that are gonna do it on their own. They're gonna partner with non-educational or non-higher ed institutions, but educational providers that are really disrupting the space. And if we don't learn how to bridge those gaps and really work together to, to use all of our talents together, universities are gonna fall behind, so. And Doris, I'll just add to that if that's okay. Sure. I, I mean, one thing I think too, we, we all have to help our students to be able to articulate those pieces that they're learning in the program as well and how they're gaining many of those skills along the way so they can demonstrate that to employers when they're ready to go get those yeah. jobs. So how do we help students articulate that they did this assignment and this captured X amount of skills, and this is what they learned. So I think credentialing or badging is one of those ways, but also helping students know how to articulate that through yeah. um, just the whole job experience yeah. itself. And that's one area I don't think as institutions we do a good job. And that's one of the areas where we're looking at building dashboards. So students, every time they leave a course, well, they go into a course, they'll see, okay, in this course, these are the three skills I'm going to learn if I do all my work and get past the assessment that gets fed into a dashboard that all along the way they see their dashboard building on new skills, which eventually ties to, now that you have this skill, here are some job openings you might wanna consider. So it's like putting the whole package together and then eventually it's, hey employers, we have this database that's tracking these skills with these students, you wanna tap in to find people, here's how to do it. And so it's really creating that full picture. And micro internships is not any different than our nursing students have clinical experience. Our teaching students have field and teaching experience. Our counseling students have counseling hours that they do. You can create that same experience in those other programs that generally historically have not had it because they weren't required to have it, but should now. So the accrediting bodies of those other programs made that a requirement, seeing the value that it delivers, but you could actually design that in those other areas too, even though it's not required. It will be by employers. So at some point you're gonna to have to do it. 
And I do apologize, but we are actually um, nearly out of time. And I don't, I hate to be the bearer of bad news to have to cut this short. That's the worst part of this, of this, uh, of this role here. Um, but is there any last parting words of wisdom from um, uh, the University of Phoenix team or any burning last minute questions from any of our educators? It doesn't look like there's questions. So I'll just say, stay connected to data that's out there. And the more you can socialize students to understanding, it's not a one and done. I have to pick my degree out of high school and that's what I'm gonna do the rest of my life, really helping them understand the value of adaptability and learning. And you're gonna have numbers of different changes through your career cycle to grow. And as long as you're willing to learn and take on, um, other opportunities, you will grow and have, you know, a, a strong career as a result of it, but it's not a linear path. I think somebody did actually raise their question at the last, the hand at the last minute. Okay, it's, it's not really a question, but it is something that uh, I am seeing from a high school level in just getting the kids to interact with electronic curriculum materials in a more introspective way because they are just so used to consuming everything that they see and they really have a difficult time transitioning that. I mean, one of the lessons that I usually have in, in one of my year one classes is how to create a document, how to save the document, how to send that document in an email. And I mean, that's a little bit less relevant now that we have Google Class and we've moved on a little bit. And I'm trying to keep up with that trend as well. But the overall footprint that technology has and their ability to use it is something that I'm having a difficult time facilitating um, because as soon as the bell rings, pff, the, the dust cloud goes away and any you know, ground that I felt like I got at that moment may be gone. But... Uh, that's just something that we're dealing, or I'm dealing with, at least at a high school level, um, trying to learn ways to make them take it a little more seriously or facilitate that they can use it as a tool, not just to consume stuff, but to actually formulate their, their path for life. Yeah. Yeah, and it's going to, you're going to see those awareness having to be pushed earlier into even middle school to start getting to think about that. Not that they're picking a career path, but starting to think about everything you're doing now is going to contribute to that, including how you engage in the internet or social media and those other things. So you, and, and what we've done is we've participated in things like this for high school, junior high, and really crafting some of the messaging and creating the awareness. So you could do more of that kind of stuff and make it fun and engaging to get them to pay attention to other people that are already in spaces doing the work um, that could tell them kind of how they got there and what the you know hiccups were, what the stumbling blocks were and how to avoid those. So you could do some of that too. I think Kim's gonna cut us off. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> we have a very strict schedule to it here too. <laughs> Um, you reach out to, uh, with more questions. If you want to provide email, that's fine too. I mean, we're open to handling questions offline too. Great. We'll really appreciate it. We'll make sure to get all of this information to you all um, through our, um, we have, where there's a Dropbox being created for all the teachers with all this great information and sharing all that, all that stuff. So um, Doris put her email into the chat for you all. Really appreciate it. And um, we'll be in touch with, with any next steps coming from, from this session. Great. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Melanie. Hey, yeah, I just wanted to say I'm so sorry I jumped on late. I got on right at 11, and I think uh, in the, for the rest of them this week, I'll try and get on, like, five, 10 minutes ahead of time before the session starts. So I didn't even think about that. I just thought, oh, it's 11 o'clock. I need to, <laughs> need to jump no, in. That could have been a miscommunication. We told all the employers to get on five minutes early so we could okay. do anything. So maybe that was just Cindy and Aaron forgot to tell you. Makes sense. No, it makes complete sense. So I was in the midst of drafting an email and I looked over, I'm like, it's 11. I need to get on. <laughs> so I sorry. called Cindy, I was like, 
can you get us in? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, it's okay. And I took notes in the chat box. So, and I, I sent them directly to you because I thought, well, you can pull out of that what is relevant in terms of the session. So, um, thank you so much. And um, I know you, the future sessions coming up. I just so you know, the Vanguard session coming up. That's on Teams. Um, I know yeah, that. I so, okay, that. good. We got that. We got that one covered because we have Teams. Um, right. The others, I do believe that they'll be doing a lot of screen sharing through Google. So I'm not sure if, if there is a way for your account to to give hostability to somebody else. Yeah, I'm wondering if so. ASU updated their Zoom uh, restrictions, and so and I don't. It's so bizarre. Like. Usually if I go in and I go into my share thing, I can say share, have others share and click a thing. On this time, for some reason it wasn't there. So I don't okay. know what, but I'm wondering, Kim, if it might be because the meeting started, if the meeting time hadn't started yet, if it gives me, but that doesn't make sense to me because I've been able to share within. But yeah, I will look into that so we don't have the struggle we had today because I couldn't share my screen. So I'll um, reach out to those presenters maybe and see if, is it is it a Google Doc they could share with me ahead of time? So if we do run into that trouble, I can just share my screen, but the information is available right at the beginning um, of the meeting. Possibly. We didn't collect anything. We just told okay. all the employers, we said, don't worry about scrambling to send us your information. Yeah. You could just share your screen. So that's the okay. thing we've been giving them. So that will be valuable. Like hopping on five, 10 minutes early is <laughs> asking the facilitator, Hey, you know, did you want to share something? Let's make sure you can, I can share your document or uh, give you share capability. So um, Great. that will hopefully solve that problem. <laughs> so. No worries. Thank you so much. Really appreciate yeah, it. It was a great conversation. Um, really enjoyed the session. So it was great. And I think Aaron knows also was sharing a screen this morning. So maybe it works. Maybe he's figured that out. I don't know. I know. I'll ask him because I'm telling you, like, sometimes it's not a problem. I just go in and I can pick share with others or whatever. But for some reason on this one, it would not. It didn't give me any options. Technology. So. <laughs> Anyway. Thank you. I really All appreciate right. it. Have a, have a great day. It's good seeing you. You as well. Bye. Bye.